But but speaking of uh, 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 average readers, uh, I don't mean to be that condescending. Uh, there's this thing that I wanted to um, uh, this article that I read in preparation for. Um, let's just share this in preparation for this conversation. Um, like th there's just you know like so so like most of the critiques of this book have actually come out in the last. Um, 15 years, right? Since publication, I believe it was like, what, 2004? So you had a bunch of stuff in like, you know, then, then 2007, 2009. And then some like later articles you keep appearing uh, on uh, the the John Williams book. Um, and I mean, I, I, I read this, uh, this was in the Washington Post. Uh, it's titled Classic Stoner, Not So Fast. So this is supposed to be a kind of, I guess, critical reappraisal because it got, like we said earlier, tons of praise um, uh, when it uh, kind of was republished back in 2004. So this article from, from 2015 by Elaine uh, Showalter, um, uh, it's interesting because like I, I sort of agree with some of the substance of the critiques, but uh, I think she just kind of misses uh, lots of the points. And the way that she phrases things, uh, she's she's clearly not understanding uh, maybe not just the book itself, but maybe literature in general. Um, like even if like some of the core propositions, like I would kind of agree with anyway, right? Like I, I always say that I'm not really interested in finding necessarily people that agree with me. I'm much more interested in people finding novel ways of saying either the same thing that I believe or things that I don't believe, right? I, I, I want novel arguments, right? I want, I, I always want like want, want something new and different and just like better in some way. Um, this kind of fails in some regards. So I just want to uh, read this over. Um, uh, so so she begin, begins her article by saying, the 50th anniversary edition of John Williams' Stoner comes garlanded with hyperbole. Brett Easton Ellis calls the novel, quote, almost perfect. Morris Dickstein raises it to, quote, perfect. Ian McEwen uh, calls it, quote, beautiful. Emma Straub dubs it, quote, the most beautiful book in the world. Um, so, like, I mean, like, like, what do you think of that so far? Like, do, do you agree that... The, the, these critiques, uh, uh, the, do you agree that this is hyperbole? Like, do, do you feel like the, the consensus is sort of not where it needs to be? Yeah, I, I agree with that. Almost perfect, perfect, and the most beautiful book in the world. Yeah. Uh, you know, a pretty, pretty big stretch there. I, I think, mm -hmm. as you and I have argued, beautiful can, can certainly be argued for with the prose and the style of it and even some of the... The, the, the feelings evoked in the reader, uh, the, you know, the relatability in your own life and some of these things, you know, it, it does have a kind of a beautiful feel to it, but yeah. yeah. Um, it garlanded with hyperbole. If, if that's the praise, that's yeah. It's over the top. And, and it, it, sh it struck me that was a little bit like, okay, I mean, you could start your, your article with that paragraph, but um, it, you know, it's almost kind of like too easy in the sense that, well, you know, almost anything that is being yeah. released or re-released and called perfect, almost always that's not going to be the case, right? Like she can take it down very easily from here. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like it's yeah, it's very it's very easy to say. Well, here's ways that it's not perfect. Yeah. Um. So, so to continue, uh, the story of William Stoner, a professor of English at the University of Missouri who fails in his marriage and career ambitions, but accepts obscurity and loneliness of the out of devotion to teaching and love of literature went unremarked on it on when it was first published in 1965. In the 21st century, however, it has become a literary phenomenon, first as an unexpected European bestseller and then as an American classic. Much of that applause hails Stoner as a devoted teacher, an exemplary scholar, and an example of all that is noble in the academic profession. As Williams said in a letter to his literary agent in the 50s, the point of the novel will be that he is a kind of saint. It is a novel about a man who finds no meaning in the world or in himself, but he does find meaning and a kind of victory in the honest and dog pursuit of his profession. So uh, like so far also, I guess, like what do, what do you think of that? Well, yeah, so this is, what we've mentioned several times now with Williams's discussion of uh, the point of the novel will be that he is a kind of saint. Um, 
he does find meaning in, in a kind of victory in the honest and dogged pursuit of his profession. So, um, yeah, I mean, there are shades of that there, like we've talked about, but I, I think calling this the point of the novel, especially from the author himself is mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's a really yeah. narrow distillation of things and it's not even completely correct. Yeah. Uh, I and, don't think. Yeah. And also, I mean, that beginning sentence, right, much of that applause hails Stoner as a devoted teacher, an exemplary scholar, and an, an example of all that is noble in the academic profession. Uh, actually, right. like, if you look at some, you know, many, you know, many of the articles and reviews, like, they, people do say that, readers do say that, which, which is also troubling, right? I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't think uh, you should uh, get out of this book thinking, wow, what an obvious example of a devoted teacher. What an obvious example of an exemplary scholar. I mean, literally nothing in the, like, like Stoner himself struggles with whether or not he's a failure as a scholar because the book is not read. And he literally can't, like at the end of, like when we read that passage when he's dying, he literally can't even find himself within the mm -hmm. text, right? Like he's, yeah. he's saying that I'm reading it, but uh, I don't even see myself. Like now that could be kind of, you know, a poetic, you know, twist on death, who knows? That could also be though that, you know, the idea that, hey, um, uh, what I think is truly me, what I have to uh, give to the world, I clearly can't give it because there's nothing that's uniquely me in this book. Anybody could have written this book. Any kind of scholar could have written this book, right? Um, you know, like there's way, there's different ways you could uh, interpret that final uh, uh, part. Um, so yeah. like, and, and, but readers do kind of think in that way, which is kind of troubling to me. Right. It, it is troubling. And it's also troubling if you're going to say much of that applause, right? So, so this is people praising the book. And yeah. part of why it's become a cult classic. Yeah, in, exactly. In our, in, in, in our time here, you and I have done way more to actually praise the book and discuss yeah. why it, you know, why it works where it works and why it doesn't work where it doesn't work as an artwork versus, yeah. oh, that was nice because he seems like a devoted teacher. Yeah, what he's a, a good guy. <laughs> yeah, what a great work of art. Uh, the, su yeah. the, the, the subject of it is a great person. It's a nice yeah. person. Uh, yeah, you know, he, it's like, he, he really persisted in, in the yeah. face of some departmental uh, feuds. Yeah, this is a great this, book. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a, such a fucking like young adult, like the fucking YA shit. This is such a YA reading of like, you know, what modern literature ought to be like. It needs to have uh, a set of like, you know, moral lessons and exemplars, right? And here's right. going to be the guy that's going to be our, our exemplar. Um, you know, and it, ju it just misses. Yeah, exactly. It misses exactly why this book would in fact be like, it, it, like that, that's a frustrating thing. Like it is a very good book, but if you're saying it's a very good book for these reasons and sorry, like I can't imagine a more boring conversation, right? The, you know, like I, I would much rather deal with somebody that thinks it's a shit book and he's going to give me all the reasons why, um, yeah. as opposed to like a fan that shares my positive assessment, but his positive assessment, uh, you know, comes down to, you know, stoner is nice. I would have wanted him as a father or, or like whatever. Um, yeah. Well, and, and now, you know, the next paragraph that you're about to read is going to get into even more problematic stuff uh, from a different angle here, because we're, we're and this, again, we're, and this is we're, the way that the word problematic should be used. Right. And, 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 and we're not going to be talking here really at all about the quality of the prose or yeah. the quality of, of the writing and the characterization mm -hmm. and the narrative arcs. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. But I'm not a fan of stoner. So first uh, she puts that in quotation marks, which, um, uh, I'm not sure. Like, and th and, and this is the thing. I remember when I first read the sites, I'm like, okay, so she puts stoner quotation marks. We learned in school that the titles of novels need to be underlined. So is she like, is she making a stylistic choice where she's talking about the novel? Is she here now talking about the character? Like at this point, I literally could yeah. not understand whether she's talking about, she's a fan personally of this character called stoner in the book or whether she's a fan of uh, the book itself. Like the fact, the fact that I am not able to make that distinction, now that is truly problematic. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is a critical lapse that is just completely unforgivable. But I am not a fan of quotation marks Stoner. Mm -hmm. First, along with other female readers, I am put off by Williams's misogyny. Second, as a professor of English, 
I am dismayed by the pedantry and narrow-mindedness of his teaching and his treatment of a dissenting student. Um, so, like, uh, notice how, like, in the first sense, she says, I'm not a fan of, quote, stoner. Okay, so again, novel or character, who knows? Then she says, I am put off by Williams' misogyny. Now, Williams, John Williams, is the author, right? It's not, it's no longer William Stoner that she's talking about. She's talking right. about uh, John Williams, the author. So she's now making the charge that John Williams, the author, is misogynistic or has misogynistic characterizations, whatever. Yeah. Uh, second, as a professor, I'm dismayed by the pedantry and our minds of his teaching. So, wait. We are we talking about John Williams or are we talking about Stoner? Like right. she literally like slips into the his as if mm -hmm. like it doesn't even fucking matter. The his could be Willie John Williams, the author. The his could be uh, William Stoner, Stoner, the character. Yeah. She literally yeah. doesn't. She thinks it doesn't matter enough. The his could be anything, right? Um, right. uh, like the two could just be conflated so easily, which is, you know, like j j just in terms of just grammatical clarity, like the fact that this is like published in a newspaper, like Washington Post. I mean, th th did nobody, and that's the thing, nobody else was confused, <laughs> you know, about what this is referring to, to say like, Hey, you know, may maybe you should, uh, make a note of this. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but, but also, uh, you know, like, like obviously like first hearing, like, you know, an author's misogyny, like obviously, yeah, I'm going to have a fucking eye roll, uh, for many of the same reasons that I put into like the, that recent video on, uh, uh, Will Noland and the patriarchy paradox video that he did. Uh, I understand there's this constant overcompensation among scholars, among academics, whatever, among, you know, people in general, the culture, whatever hegemonic culture is. You know, they overcompensated. They think everything is misogynistic. But, you know, I will be honest, like, you know, Edith is, to the extent that we could say that anyone or anything is a misogynistic character or written in a way that's misogynistic. I mean, Edith is literally a, like, caricatured, depressed um, female that manipulates her way through a marriage and, and manipulates the good graces of her, like, dunce husband and becomes like a fucking like animal lecherous you know you know like uh, animal in heat when she wants to get pregnant um and has no other redeeming qualities has no real complexity has no real resolution that we can speak of other than a kind of like hasty a little bit cheapened one um can we not say that there is like like uh, maybe we don't like i don't know what other word other misogyny that we would use but how, how would you characterize that trope in literature because i mean she very much fits that trope if we could say it's a trope if we could say it's a misogynistic trope like she fits that right i mean i don't see any other purpose and i don't think it's unfair to characterize especially in the sexual scenes as like you know like a dog in heat when she finally wants to get pregnant i mean it's it's i i think it's um yeah i mean like so so may, maybe you could comment on that part i guess right well i I think in a sense, you and I, we've already broken down our problems with Edith as a character. Yeah. I don't know that we necessarily need to rehash that. And we have faulted Williams for for some poor characterization. Exactly. Now, again, as an author, that's the bigger problem uh -huh. than whether she's portrayed misogynistically. Yeah. Um, it, it is a problem. And we agree that the two, you know, they go hand in hand. He could have written a less misogynistic character that was also a better character and, and gave, yeah. gave us as the reader more to work with and gave him more to play off of, uh, you know, with the interactions with not just stoner, but, but or, or the opposite, right? Like he could have written a non-misogynistic character that was just even worse as a character it was even more caricatured in some way, you know, True. you know, yeah, yeah. Could have been, you know, the, the, the perfect, uh, you know, can't, can do no wrong kind of woman and stoner is some kind of like monster, or, uh, who knows? Yeah. I mean, it could have been, it could have been multiple missteps there. Um, but, but again, you know, like if, if you're a professor of literature at, at an Ivy league school, and this is, you know, what you're most upset about, uh, yeah. in the book, we, we, we've got, we've got a, a bigger fish to fry here. You know? Yeah. And, and that's the thing. I mean, and, and you know, on some level, I, I, I don't want to make this argument too strongly because I'm not sure how much of it uh, I truly buy, but, um, 
if you're writing bad female or bad male characters, on some level, they are going to be kind of like baseline misogynistic or, you know, um, what's the term for hating men? Misandrist, right? So, yeah. um, uh, uh, you know, like if you're writing a woman that's like a caricature, well, some of the characters I'm sure are going to be like, you know, feminine characters, right? So to, 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 to the degree that that's misogynistic, like that's going to be kind of a baseline, right? So, um, but, but again, you, you, the way that you short, short circuit, like something like the misogyny, you have the following fucking precept for every author to follow. Make sure that number one, you write a great character, right? Because mm -hmm. if you have a great character, you're not going to be able to make these. Sometimes maybe you can, but generally speaking, you're not going to be able to make these kinds of judgments like one of the, like one of the judgments against like woody allen is like oh he's such a fucking you know piece of shit in his personal life but you know uh to the extent that anyone could call him misogynistic even if you believe in the sexual abuse allegations against him i mean he's written the best fucking female characters of any you know uh filmmaker uh period right Mm -hmm. um you know or, or some of the best at least right even if you think that's excessive some of the best female characters period to do that you must be able to be empathetic towards women or at least for the time being be right. empathetic like towards women G get get it get into their minds uh, 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 try to understand how they would behave in various situations. Try to understand their motives as distinct from your own motives that you might have towards a woman. Um, and, and, you know, uh, to, to that extent that you would do that, that is not misogyny. That is, you know, a genuine kind of empathy. Um, so if you have that genuine empathy to start, like we could short circuit shit like misogyny and not be needlessly controversial if we tackle the characterization itself. And, um, you know, and the question is like, well, uh, does her description actually tackle the characterization? And I think to some degree it doesn't, some degree it doesn't. And also, but, you know, the, the, the second part, I guess we're going to get into as well. I'm dismayed by the penetrating narrow minds of his teaching, meaning, you know, uh, William Stoner's teaching and his treatment of a dissenting student. Again, we could sort of say that, but that's not, um, you know, that's, we can't just leave the critique there. Maybe you could read more of it. I'm, I feel like I'm talking well, too much. Well, hold on one, one second there on, the, on her second part of that paragraph too. Okay. Again, it's, it has missed one of the core points though. One of the key reasons that he treats Walker the way he does is to protect Catherine Driscoll. Yeah. Who later on becomes, you know, this very positive point in his life who is certainly not a misogynistic character mm -hmm. right is a is a for all intents and purposes a good woman like yeah. we've we've talked about is she a great professor or a great artist you know it seems not but she's she seems like a good person and she loves stoner well and uh she doesn't cause scenes and you know she's like edith's foil in a lot of ways in his life right so uh william is also perfectly capable of writing a non-misogynistic female character mm -hmm obviously um but but yeah i mean to to say that again i have a problem with the entire novel stoner because william stoner the main character and, and we and we don't even know that like the, the stoner quotation we're like what is that i, I don't uh, get it i don't understand what's going on here i really don't right we're still not totally sure but let's say it is about stoner the central character i you know i didn't like the fact that he was pretty mean and uh you know and, and boxed out a potentially, you know, a dissenting and maybe kind of promising-ish student from the doctoral program uh, for for some petty disagreements. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what people do. Yeah. People do this in the world. Yeah. Like, I don't understand why this is a problem with yeah. the novel. This, this is yeah. a, a very real thing, a realistic scenario. Yeah. People do this shit all the time. The question is, like, uh, you know, and if Williams is in fact critiquing this as, like, you know, to some degree, I think we've made the case that just based on text alone. We don't know truly where William stands, which is kind of a problem for the book in terms of really reaching like true greatness. It does not have that totalizing sort of you know force, but we we know, we have conceded that it's an open ended question as to whether or not he is critiquing Stoner uh, for be. not being an yeah. artist, for not being able to like you know be anything other than essentially a scholarly cleric. Um, yeah. uh, uh, and, and, you know, uh, we also know that uh, much of what these students are, are saying, this this student and, and, and Lomax, for that matter, uh, it's just kind of its own variety of bullshit, right? Um, so it, it's open-ended enough that 
we don't even we can't even say for a fact that Williams is not offering this critique of Stoner and his treatment of the student, even if he's critiquing the student as well. Um, so, and, and the fact that like, you know, like you could have, you could ultimately make the argument that, you know, I don't believe that he's critiquing. And I think you, you could make a successful argument there, but um, uh, you would have to like put that disclaimer into this article. You can't just leave it at that. You have to have these disclaimers if you're going to say that, you know? Yes. Um, yeah, correct. So, I mean, then moving on to the next paragraph, she makes the points like the novel's not autobiographical completely. We talked about that some, uh, but the last sentence there, but his novel is tenderly protective of its passive hero and presents him as helplessly sinned against. Again, I think you and I have made the case. That's not, mm -hmm. that's certainly not the only reading of it. And I would contend it's not the correct reading yeah. of it. Um, you know, it, even if Williams says so in an interview, We've talked about before numerous times how sometimes the artist doesn't even understand their own work. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, unbeknownst to him, Williams wrote a, a better novel here than he even realized. Yeah. I think and, so. Uh, yeah. And cored more deeply into some things than, than he understood himself to have done. So yeah. uh, again, you know, it's, uh, it's not the case out and out that stoner is, is just put on a pedestal and, Oh my God, can you believe all these horrendous things that happened to this noble creature who ended up dying of cancer all over his body at a kind of early age? Like he's a saint, you know, it, no, it's, it's, mm -hmm. if, if you're reading in a nuanced way, there are critiques of stoners, you know, stoner himself mm -hmm. sprinkled in throughout. Mm -hmm. And he's, uh, while he, while he can be empathized with, he's far from perfect. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I mean, like, I'm just getting this like sinking feeling. Uh, I'm not sure if you are that, uh, uh, she seems to not really care about books at all. Right. Like just, just like even thinking about, um, uh, like she's, she's, she's literally not thinking about the book. You know what I mean? She's just not, uh, mm -hmm. Elena Showalter. Um, it's just, you know, like I, I, I don't, I don't understand how you could like be into literature, but not really think, be thinking about it either. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, you ha you've got to be able to parse these things out. Yeah. You know, if, if you read a book and, and you want to make some of these assertions about not liking a, a misogynistic yeah. character portrayal. And so, I mean, that's fine, but offer us some other things too. give, give talk about the writing itself. Talk about, the, yeah. the good points you know overall is just the general statement i'm not a fan of stoner yeah okay yeah. <laughs> i'm not yeah. i'm not a fan of the denver broncos but maybe their quarterback's good you know yeah and like and if you don't care about these other layers it's like well why do you then care about literature like uh, do you really get like some fucking cakes from reading this book and talking about its misogyny like is that really is that really interesting that's really interesting to you like I, like what is interesting about that it's not um mm -hmm. you know uh, uh anyway but 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 here's the thing i mean yeah. like uh, not to be too too critical of this because you know, to, uh, whether or not uh you know uh, well you know she does think that she's making a valid critique in this next paragraph and uh, i i i agree that in terms of like strict characterization i mean she does make good points here about kind of what happens with edith edith edith's character in the book um the worst of stoner's afflictions is his marriage he is consistently rejected and irrationally sabotaged by his wife, Edith, who is portrayed as a neurotic harpy. All that is true. Initially, a sheltered society girl, shy and earnest about her duties to her husband. I'm not so sure about that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, she, she, th that could have been all an act, right? Like, you know, um, you know that, 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 that's, that's the thing about like talking about, like if you want to fucking talk about sexual dynamics, you're going to have to talk about the ways in which women do have power. And one of the possibilities is men can easily be manipulated uh, sexually and otherwise, you know, by uh, a pretty girl. Right. Um, and you, you could say that that is a sexist reading, but you know, th this is part of the book. And if that's part of this, if that is the sexism that is part of this book, you can't say shy and earnest about her duties. Right. Mm -hmm. um she's not right like if we're saying that it's a sexist portrayal from the beginning she's that neurotic harpy even if she hides it right so th th this is kind of like almost like a contradiction with her own like reading of it right which is weird 
She's so sexually repressed that on their honeymoon, she throws up when he embraces her. They're both virgins. But then Edith decides she wants to have a baby and abruptly becomes a, quote, wild and demanding, end quote, erotomaniac, crouching naked on the unmade bed all day and, quote, clutching and tearing at his clothes when he comes home. Now, that part is correct. And to the extent that you would kind of ever write a woman like this into your um, novel and make her like the central figure, I mean... First of all, uh, before saying even getting to the misogyny part, we know that is a huge fucking gamble in terms of having a good character because this is a a red fucking flag, you know, trite characterization of women, right? Historically, right? I mean, um, you know, and we we, we literally, like, she's not wrong when she makes this critique. We literally do get that. She demands to have a baby and she becomes this like wild and demanding erotomaniac and she's portrayed in almost animalistic fashion. Uh, and, th- and, and, you know, if she had other complex qualities, this could have been perfectly fine. This, this literally like the, the fact that she could be so complex, let's say, and could also be this like animal like woman. That's an interesting contrast, like that you wouldn't associate somebody that, that is able to live like a rich, you know, life of the mind, let's say. Um, uh, but but um, uh, 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 we, we, like, we don't get the complexity. We simply get the animal nature, which like, sorry, like it, it's a deficiency of the characterization. So I, I don't think it's wrong to say that. But l- like we said, like we wouldn't really phrase things in that way. Um, uh, uh, as, uh, as soon as she's pregnant, she tells Stoner that, quote, she could not endure the touch of his hand upon her, end quote. These inexplicable transformations occur throughout their lives. Also kind of true. Like, it's not, you know, her, it's it's consistent in the sense that she's consistently, like, crazy and unpredictable, right? Mm-hmm. Doesn't even give a fuck eventually about, like, the, 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 the affair. Um, but... You know, uh, uh, from a writerly perspective, these are not very good choices for characterization. That you know, the, the fact that they're inexplicable—that's not good characterization. Um, when their daughter's born, Edith becomes a bedridden invalid for a year, then it goes through a series of personality changes, sometimes ag- agoraphobic, sometimes desperately social. She joins a little theater group, designs and paints sets, attempts sculpture, and starts obsessively practicing the piano two or three hours a day, like a faculty wife version of Zelda Fitzgerald. At the same time, she pressures him into overspending, separates him from his beloved daughter, takes over a study for her art studio, and allows his books and manuscripts to be damaged or destroyed. Literally, like you know, uh, uh, a literal caricature, right? I mean, like, mm-hmm. w- like, would you say that this is a, f- a fair characterization of how Edith is depicted? Yeah, this paragraph is spot yeah. on, and yeah. so th- this this highlights quite well and succinctly the issues that we talked about. For yeah. you know, we went on at length uh, earlier yeah. in the video. Yeah, um, I feel like I'm talking a lot. You want to take the rest? Sure. <laughs> When Williams sent a draft of the novel to his agent, Marie Rodell, in the summer of 1963, she was uneasy about the wife's character and wrote back that, quote, Edith's motivations, end quote, need amplification. He made some changes in his account of the couple's courtship, which he thought made Edith's subsequent behavior, quote, more believable. But he makes no effort to explain her feelings. She remains shrewishly and selfishly indifferent to Stoner's professional travails and personal disappointments. She seems to exist only to torment her husband. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So again, I think we'd believe we would uh, agree w- with yeah. this, you know, and, and the issues there. Yeah. Um, although Stoner is also presented as a dedicated teacher, he can be punitive and harsh, and is unable to admit his own culpability. Williams tells us that despite an almost religious calling to teach literature, Stoner finds it hard to communicate his passion. We talked about that earlier too. Mm-hmm. At last, after decades of trying. He enjoys some, quote, modest popularity, end quote, in the classroom, but the fates will not allow him to succeed for long. When a PhD candidate named Charles Walker pleads for late admission to his graduate seminar, Stoner assents with reluctance. His first impression of Walker is unpleasantly visceral. The young man has a crippled left arm and foot, end quote, shuffles with a grating sound as he walks. Walker shows up late for the class and interrupts Stoner's lecture on grammar and rhetoric with annoying questions about the relevance of grammar to great poetry. After a few weeks, Stoner and the other students silence Walker's interventions, but he finally gets his say in a seminar paper that challenges the premises of the course and critiques the paper of a female student whom Stoner particularly admires. 
So, I mean, in this paragraph, uh, you know, her, her wording is, is interesting again. And it's just, it's kind of strange to me. Like his first impression of Walker is unpleasantly visceral because she's making the case that, that Williams aired by creating a character in Stoner who was unfair to a student. Right. Yeah. Like that's, that's an argument from earlier in this article. So then we're setting it up to where like, oh, Stoner, you know, doesn't really like this guy from the jump because he's crippled. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Like, again, again, is this, is this Williams's problem? Mm -hmm. Like, he, he, if anything, this is an issue with Stoner mm -hmm. himself yeah, as exactly. a person, as a character, yeah. where he's once again, not completely sheltered and protected mm -hmm. by the author, you mm -hmm. know, and, and I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I'd have to go back and reread that section. I don't know that I necessarily, when I was reading, it was like, oh, Stoner obviously immediately is biased against this guy just because he, it, it, you know, is imperfect physically. I, mm -hmm. I don't recall realizing like, Ooh, I kind of don't like that Stoner just immediately dismisses this guy because mm -hmm. he doesn't walk normally. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have anything to say about that, but, um, uh, I, I think actually, uh, uh, Stoner is, there are some passages where he's kind of intimidated by, uh, Walker's like, you know, uh, like hand, like I don't know exactly what the nature of the handicaps are, but like physically like handicapped, um, and and uh, uh, like at some point like he tries to like really avoid him as he's kind of like struggling to like go after Stoner faster and faster, and then oh, like right. yeah, there's a passage where he's like he felt ashamed, right? He felt yeah. ashamed at, at having done that. So he uh, I, I I you know um, the, the the thing that I would ask though is okay so. Uh, uh, we know that John Williams himself seems to feel like, okay, uh, I have a saintly character named Stoner and he's like, you know, he's very, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, he, he succeeds as a scholar. Let, let's just assume that all that consensus reading is, is correct. Uh, clearly then if I'm like the good guy in the text, my adver adversaries then are going to have something like a physical handicap or be like somehow like monstrous in some way, like, or, or be kind of like, you know, classically, you know, Charles uh, uh, Dickens esque, right? Uh, mm -hmm. What is, what is it? Is there like a specific phrase for Dickens esque anyway, but you know, like this kind of like Dickens esque, like uh, almost like Gothic fucking like villain type, which, you know, if you think Stoner is the hero here, uh, 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 the, 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 this guy that's just like interrupting the classroom and just misbehaving, um, he, you know, he must like on some level, like just feel like, uh, yeah, like I, I'm going to, you know, like uh, show this guy a, as, a, as a, you know, cripple to make him into this kind of, you know, very visceral villain, right? Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, though, like we did say that, yes, it's frustrating that, John Williams himself does not take a true position here on, you know, Stoner's knowledge of art, right? Or, you know, like questions of like failure. Um, uh, and, 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 and that's a problem. But uh, the fact that there is like enough ambiguity that we can make arguments one way or the other, um, you know, the, the effect would be the opposite. It's, you know, let's turn, you know, Stoner into someone that's like a little bit of villain-esque. And let's also give, you know, uh, Williams like positive uh, qu qu uh, qualities, but let's also give Walker the positive quality that, hey, he's a kind of an out-of-the-box thinker. And because he's outside of the box in some way, he has something to offer. But also let's again critique Charles Walker by making him an out-of-the-box thinker that nonetheless still has nothing to offer like to, you know, uh, uh, art, right. Or to criticism, to scholarship, um, mm -hmm. because his viewpoints, although outside the box in relation to Stoner are just as generic, you know, on another kind of fundamental level. Um, so we could, we could go back and forth and, you know, again, like you, you could make, you could take a position yourself one way or the other, even if Williams uh, himself does not want to, um, cause you still have the text in front of you, right? You still have evidence like going one way or another way, but you're going to have to contextualize and, and give this discussion. If you're going to talk about this question of how he treats the student, right? We, we can't say for certain that because here she does the opposite she here like stoner becomes the absolute villain mistreating charles walker 
right? And Charles Walker is the quiet hero. Like, let, let's just listen to how she talks about Charles Walker. When a PhD candidate named Charles Walker pleads for late admission to his graduate <laughs> seminar, not like he was like some lazy fuck that didn't do what he was supposed to do. And it's constantly like ill-prepared in every way, like every time that we see him. And it's like, just so kind of like, you know, mealy fucking mouthed. Um, yeah. Stoner assents with reluctance. Uh, his first impression of Walker is unpleasantly visceral. The young man has a crippled left arm and foot and shuffles with a grating sound as he walks. Walker shows up late for the class and interrupts Stoner's lecture and grammar and rhetoric with annoying questions about the relevance of grammar to great poetry. After a few weeks, Stoner and the other students silence Walker's interventions, but he finally gets to say in a seminal paper that challenges the premises of the course and critiques of the paper of a female student whom Stoner Stoner particularly admire. So first of all, Stoner is like the, the paternalistic old fuck that is just lusting after like a younger student. Uh, uh, the, Charles Walker, he's framed as merely challenging the premises of the course, right? As if like you could imagine like a modern day woke student, like saying, you know, I think this is a racist fucking class and here's why, and here's my fucking manifesto, right? Um, uh, 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 annoying questions about the relevance of grammar to great poetry. Like, no, like, no, like she's framing it where like everything that he's doing is something that obviously Stoner as a teacher needs to assent to and think is reasonable. When I think reading the text, like, okay, some of the things might be reasonable, but he is just fucking annoying. He's in a, like Charles Walker is fucking annoying. Like he's yeah. not like a force for good in the book. I don't think. Yeah, I think I think like you could try to make that argument, but it is it is a hard one to make. Um, Stoner is outraged, right? At, at this like reasonable kid just you know trying to be a good student. After class, he charges Walker with dodging the assignment, as if he fucking doesn't. He literally turns in the paper on like like the topic a topic that he said that he wasn't going to do. Right. He said what he's going to do a paper on. He literally fucking like turns into completely something else. Like literally nothing to do with what he said he was going to do. Um, literally nothing to do with the topic of the class. Uh, and, and, and like, like uh, you went to college. I went to college. I wouldn't fucking dare do that. I just wanted my fucking A and to get out. Like what yeah. the fuck? Like, oh, you want to be like, you want to be a hero in your fucking college campus. Talk yeah, about that fucking, yeah. Talk about fucking like bad motivation. Like talk about not having motivated reasoning. You want to be the fucking academic rebel. And, and, and you, and, and, and you think I'm just going to hand in a paper and something else. I want to get my fucking A and get the fuck out and actually do something valuable outside of that system, right? Like not, not like literally like try everything within your power. Like, oh my God, please don't fail me. Oh my God, let me in. Like you're literally trying to do everything within your power to be so in, in, in ensconced in this institution. And th which is why I call him so fucking mealy mouth. Like he's so like, you know, like, like Chris Walker is not a pleasant character, right? The way that she characterized him is just wrong. Yeah. Um, well, right. And, and, and if, if he's going to be such an iconoclast and bring these, you know, uh, uh, earth shaking ideas and all mm -hmm. that, let's just shake up the whole literature department, whatever. It's like, yeah, so go write the next great book of poetry, bro. Mm -hmm. Like instead he's just in there still wanting his PhD, still wanting mm -hmm. to become a professor. And like, you know, by, by slightly tweaking or fine tuning the take uh, of a couple lat phrases mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. on Shakespeare or whatever like that's really gonna just you know move the tectonic plates of the arts and uh, we need to grant him you know whatever kind of license he needs because he's obviously just brilliant mm -hmm. um, yeah it's, it's, it's silly it's silly yeah and, and then like like startled Walker protests that he quote always thought the disagreement was healthy. I assumed they were big enough to like li like he's literally like doing this thing. He he's doing this like you know uh, I think one of the reasons why uh, like he he's doing this thing where um uh uh uh, uh he's just clearly being sarcastic in a very kind of like overly feminine way, which is one of the ways where he's made to be this like grotesque like unmasculine sort of character which like okay you could say like is maybe not a good character but uh, uh, uh the fact is it's like this thing is not meant to be ser taken seriously always thought the disagreement was healthy i assumed that you were big like th th this wasn't meant to put walker in a nice light and she says stoner goes ballistic accusing walker of laziness and dishonesty and ignorance i mean he was all those things 
yeah. threatens to flunk him unless he writes a new paper. Guess what? I fucking went to college too. I would be fucking flunked if I turned in a paper on like some topic that wasn't assigned just because I wanted to, right? You're not going to yeah. be a hero there. Um, uh, uh, everything else is bullshit. Uh, threatens to flunk him, you know, as he should. He's a professor, right? Like imagine like, oh, I, I'm going to be a professor and I'm, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you Charles Walker a double fucking standard. I'm going to give you all this extra leeway that nobody else gets to have, right? Like, because if you do that, suddenly you're charged, of course, with being, you know, uh, ableist in your writing, right? Clearly, you're being paternalistic, just like a feminist could charge, you know, uh, 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 Williams and Stoner, you know, of being paternalistic here. Like, oh, look at him going ballistic just to protect, you know, uh, 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 the, the fucking delicate may maiden that um uh, uh he you know uh, he thinks can't defend herself right um yeah. uh, who, who also is like as narrow-minded as he is and you know sees an ally in and he just wants to fuck right like you know so like th this is like and like th like think about everything think about all the fucking context that we had to set think about every all the surrounding paragraphs that we discussed i had to literally say that this quote is taken out of context to mean the exact opposite of what williams is saying um and none of this is set up in this article uh you know uh uh uh, uh, uh anyway uh uh, th th this is more or less how it ends. I'm not sure if you want to keep keep going with this thing or what. Kind of, yeah, kind I, of I, I, eating let's, it with let's, utility. Let's skip skip further down. Yeah. 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 Um, and then Lomax, of course, is like presented as a fucking like revolutionary, right? Like, and it's like you know another careerist fuck, you know that. Yeah. Um. Oh, oh, and, and uh, yeah, so, so uh, like Dan Schneider has always written uh, of this and I've never, uh, I've never really seen it that often myself, but I remember this, uh, his precept uh, immediately when I read uh, the kind of ending paragraph here where uh, uh, Dan Schneider in Cosmoetica, he always says that, uh, hey, um, even when modern critics do negative appraisals or reappraisals of texts, what oftentimes happens is after saying all the negative shit, they then spend a paragraph like reneging on all the arguments that they made and still call it an excellent book um, uh, just because they don't want to take a fucking position as well. Like they, they're just they're as fucking mealy mouthed as Charles Walker is. Right. Um, as in some ways, maybe perhaps John Williams is a little bit with not taking true you know, set of positions as he ought in this book. Um uh, 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 she, she nearly ends. This is the penultimate paragraph. This is how she nearly ends her um, uh, 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 article, right? That seems to be very critical of the text. Now, strangely, he is a moving, meaning stoner, uh, a moving exemplar for many readers who see him as an inspiring model of integrity, who faces his sad life with unflinching courage and finds redemption and faithfulness to his ideals. They revere Williams' artistry as a writer of restrained, unsentimental prose that carries great emotional weight. So literally, she fucking gives it up. She says, yeah, in a technical sense, he's, a, he's, a, he's an excellent writer. Like, she literally sure. says, this is a good book. This is well-written. This ought to be read by the standards, the, the only set of standards that we could have for books, right, which is worthy of reading. Literally, the only fucking standard available to you. Is uh -huh. this worthy of reading, yes or no? Um, and depending on how you answer yes or no, there could be many different reasons. But at, at minimum, you need a book to be yes, be worthy of reading by, you know, uh, a human being. Um, and she's saying that, in fact, you know, uh, John Williams' Stoner is a book worth reading. But it starts with the title, Classic Stoner, Not So Fast, right? And the entire article is why it's not, right? But she literally spends the sense giving up that completely, right? She said, and she could say, you know, my critique of misogyny might stand, but um, uh, 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 I'm not willing to say that this is not a classic because the one sentence is they revere Williams' artistry as a writer of restrained, unsentimental prose that carries great emotional weight. Rediscovered at a time when the humanities are in decline, academic jobs are scarce, and teaching takes a backseat to blogging. And oh my fucking goodness, look at her fucking moralizing about this. The humanities are in decline as if you fucking, with these fucking articles that you write, aren't directly responsible for this shit. <laughs> 
<laughs> as if like you're not like literally showing exactly why this happened right uh it's just moralizing like you know give me fucking money like i want to be on the up and up once again um humanities are in decline academic jobs are scarce she wants more fucking academics she wants the fucking diploma mill to continue she wants the status quo to continue because she's so dependent on the status quo a hundred fucking percent she's a biden voter she, she fucking <laughs> voted by a hundred percent she has to this is the function that she fulfills um <laughs> uh, and, and and teaching takes a backseat to blogging. Oh my fucking goodness! You think your fucking teaching like uh, was 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 better than my blogging when I blogged? Give me a fucking break, girl. You know what the fuck? Like I like I because I didn't get a PhD. I did. I did. I didn't shape fucking minds. You know in the right way. Right, uh, as if Dan Schneider didn't fucking shape minds in the right way, right? Because uh, all he fucking did was blog. All I fucking did did was blog. Um, uh, uh, the the no the novel's message of humble and heroic service. So now this is a positive. This is where the novel gets good. <laughs> the novel is now good because that's a message of humble and heroic service. Um, yeah, I mean, he, maybe he would have taken the last sentence. Uh, I feel like I'm getting very uh, out of steam now yeah yeah well the, the, i've reached my heights for the night yeah well, the last the last sentence again I, I think you and i spent a good amount of our time today on the episode uh you know going counter to this but the final sentence says but williams's insistence on making stoner a blameless martyr rather than a man with choices and denying him any ironic self-awareness about the causes of his job-like misfortunes leaves the novel far from perfect so yeah, I, I think we've discussed and dissected quite well how, uh, on a more careful reading, Stoner is not—he's he, not invincible. He is not put in the glass case to only be admired. Um, you know, and I mean, it's interesting. It's even another way to, to maybe run counter to some of her points here. Like you, you and I are like straight male readers of this book too. You know what I mean? Like we, we should be the kind of people who would like want to stand in and find ourselves in a way uh you know aligning with yeah this vision of of this you know every man stoic every man who just bears the evils of you know relationships and women and the man and all this kind mm -hmm. of stuff and we've we've broken that down and said you know it, it doesn't really hold water and here's why and so um anyway you know i, I we don't have anything invested in the messages, we're just trying to talk about the writing and the quality of the book and mm -hmm. the way that, you know, the, because it's a well-written book, Williams, you know, although agreed, it's not a perfect novel. That's, that's for sure. But, uh, but it's a good novel and it's, it's got plenty of merits. Mm -hmm. And uh, while there's some missteps, they, they aren't, they aren't really where she tries to pin them here.